The reading today is from James, chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Those who listen to the word but do not do what it says are like people who look at their faces in a mirror and after looking at themselves, go away and immediately forget what they look like. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Inga. I could still note people just hit autopilot and open their Bibles, didn't they? They couldn't help it. <laughs> the reason I asked you to keep your Bibles closed is because I want to just invite you into the world of James. Okay, I'm not telling you that we shouldn't read the Bible. So what I'm going to ask you to do now for those, all of us, is just to turn to your neighbour and just turn around, close your Bible, and say, what did Inga just read? Just turn, back, turn around and say, what did you hear? Just for, just for 30 seconds. What? Yeah. Can you remember? Have we got it? What was fascinating was that just observing people just automatically had to open their Bibles to start with, which I just thought was hilarious. But the second thing is that it's, it's hard to, to kind of just take everything in. Some of you, I'm sure, just remembered everything that was what Inga read. Let me, shall I read it to you again? Because I know you don't have your Bibles open, and then I will let you open your Bibles if you want to. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Those who listen to the word but do not do what it says are like people who look at their faces in a mirror and after looking at themselves go away and immediately forget what they look like. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James is talking to a culture which is an oral culture. It's a, co a culture that hears, that heard the word. They didn't have books, Bibles like we have here today. They didn't have digital devices, obviously, like we have today. It was an oral culture. So it was far more about communal learning. It was all about hearing. It was all about storytelling. It was all about memorization. And so every Jewish boy grew up learning, having to learn the Torah off by heart, the law of the Lord off by heart. For the vast majority of our, uh, over the centuries, over the history of the world, it has been an oral learning culture. Then something radical happened, the printing press. The printing press came along and all of a sudden mass printing was distributed throughout the world or at least the Western world as, we knew, as it was at the time. And so something sh it changed within the way that people learnt. They could read, they didn't need to memorise. Why bother memorising if you can read a resource that you have? You can always go back to it. Or you just write it down. You don't need to memorise. It shaped the way that people thought. All of a sudden things became individualised. Learning became not communal, but personal. And now we are in a culture which is going through radical transformation, as Rod spoke about a couple of weeks ago, where information is immediate. Information is taken outside of its locality, its historical and local context. It's shifted across the world at lightning speed. Starting, It started with perhaps the telegram, where information was able to be sent very quickly outside its social and historical setting. And that has continued with the telephone, to television, to the internet, 
to personal digital devices. And it's not just about information. There are different media. You know, we could talk about technology now as this is technology, but, you know, talking when you refer to the Gutenberg Press, and that was technology for the day. The invention of the wheel, that was technology. Technology and mediums move and change. They are an extension in some ways of who we are. But they are not neutral. They shape the way we think. What was really interesting um, as I was reading is, um, you know, when people used to come to church before the printing press, people didn't sit in pews like this. They used to come and stand and hear the word being spoken and, and they would sing together standing in a communal space. Now we, you know, with the printing press came pews. And what do pews kind of look like? They look like a piece, of, a page in a, in a book. Columns. You look this now, this is how you read a book. You, you read through columns. What's really interesting is that our evening service, we don't sit in columns and pews like this. We have cushions thrown out all around the place and we've got you know, everything slightly random. And it's really interesting. I wonder whether that reflects something of what the way that we are changing in our thought process, the way that we function as a society. The reason this is important is because as we look at this passage today in James, we want to be able to see through how culture influences the way we think and the way we learn, to see how God can shape our thinking, how God sh should be shaping the way in which we see culture, the way that we see truth, the way that we interpret information. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, James is predominantly speaking in a wisdom genre. He is wanting to communicate wisdom. And today we're going to look at wisdom. So three really quick things we're going to look at this, this morning. Firstly, we want to, James is going to show us what the difference is between information and wisdom. And particularly, we're going to look at how we read the Bible and why we read the Bible. So firstly... James says in verse 22 that information is not wisdom. Information is not wisdom. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I think every culture throughout history has said that knowledge is power. Knowledge equals power. Power. We are in this continual pursuit of information. We are in this continual pursuit of knowledge. And we are in an age where information is in abundance. We are in an age of information overload. I was reading a BBC article this week uh, which said this, according to estimates from Scandinavian Research Centre, Sintef, 90% of all the da data, 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 sorry, all of the data the human race has ever produced has been generated in the past two years. 90% of all data in the last two years. The explosion is due to the rise of the web, smartphones, social media, and the big data, data, data projects in which businesses, governments, and scientists are involved. We are in an age of information overload. Sergey Brin, the uh, co-founder of Google, admitted that some people see Google as God. Google as God. Why? Because they are about organizing and shaping information through algorithmic systems so that it can turn out information just the way we need it, just the way we want it. And these pr processes provide us with, they say, the power to develop and to change. The power of Google. We are in an information age and we are bombarded with information. But James says here that the consumption, the accumulation of knowledge and information alone is deception. Deception. It's deception. We are deceived if we hear but do not apply. 
True wisdom is doing. You see, hearing is, I think that it's not just that hearing actually is doing. Because if we don't do it, then I don't think that we've truly heard. And so James calls us and pushes us towards seeking the right information. And where do we find the right source of knowledge and information? Well, it's in the Word of God. James points us to the word of God. When he talks about the word here, he is talking about God's word. It's God's word by which we look at everything else. It's through the lens of God's word that we absorb information. And so the challenge for us, I think, today, as we sit here, as we consider the culture in which we live and breathe, is to ask ourselves the questions, what is the lens with which we look at this world? What is the lens in which we consume and absorb information? You see, I think that we are really challenged culturally with options and choice. The reality is with all this information that is being thrown at us, we, we we find ourselves challenged with choice. I want to call, I don't know whether this is the right word or not, but choice phobia. There's this fear of choosing. Why? Because there are so many options. And we need a way in which we can decipher information. And so we need to turn to scripture as our method for interpreting information. And so I don't, as I, as I, as we continue, I don't want you to hear me being bashing up this culture in the digital age. I, I don't, that's not my goal, but I, I want to come with force because I think that we, are la- I know for myself, and we, as a, I think possibly as a community, are largely blind to actually what's going on as we live and swim in this digital age. You see, because when we get the, the lens right, when we can understand how we receive information, then we'll be able to both critique the culture in which we live, but we'll also be able to create in the culture in which we live. We will be able to critique and we'll be able to create. So James points us to the word. So how are we to read the Bible? How are we to read the Bible? Well, James gives us some wonderful wisdom here of how we are to read the Bible to, to see God's word. Verse 23 to 25 says this again, those who listen to the word but do not do it, do what it says, are like people who look at their faces in a mirror and after looking at themselves, go away and immediately forget what they look like. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, dot, dot, dot. I'll continue that in a minute. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Firstly, I think that God, that that James is telling us to read with humility. And I've really grappled with this. You know, what is the right word that that, that can summarize what James is saying here? And I've landed on humility. It could be we are called to read in quiet. We are called to read with silence. We are called to read to expecting with expectancy, expectancy to respond. But all of that, I think, points to a humility. A humility that allows us to be able to see that the word of God is addressing us. So James looks at this idea of a mirror and says that someone who looks into a mirror and sees the information, sees what the mirror presents, or even looks at the nice mirror and the you know, nice surroundings, but doesn't actually receive back what it's saying and goes away and does nothing about it, is a fool. Now, I'm looking around at some of you guys now and I'm just wondering whether that, that, you know, what happened this morning? Maybe some of this has been played out. You know, you looked at the mirror and you actually forgot that, that you needed to shave or at least brush, brush your hair. Maybe I'm being a little bit harsh. I'm sorry. I, you know. But that's what it's like. Looking in the mirror and going, oh my goodness, I actually do need to shave. My hair looks terrible. And then going, uh, 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 and then just going, oh, butterfly. You know, <laughs> like a squirrel. Um, 
Someone who looks in the mirror and then just does not take in. You know, it, it might be about, we, and we can approach information, we can, we can approach God's word and we look at it and we kind of look at all the nuances in the words and we, we, you know, that's very interesting. We get really analytical. We look at how, you know, the context of when it was written and we, we, we go into the scientific processes of, of, of the Bible. But we never, ever read it as if it is addressing us, that it is saying something both to us and saying something about us. I know this for myself. You open up the Bible and you read it and it's tiring and it's boring and it's like, oh, it's just words on a page. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian and philosopher, said this, if God's work, word is merely a doctrine, something impersonal and objective, then it is no mirror. An objective doctrine cannot be called a mirror. It is just impossible to look at yourself in an object doctrine as to look at yourself in a wall. We are not looking at just words on a page. You see, God's word is something very different to a book. God's word addresses us and speaks to us, which means that it requires us to be silent. We humble ourselves before Scripture, the Bible, as we read it, and we say, God, speak to me. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Here's my encouragement to you, and this is something that was profound for me in understanding this, is that we don't read the Bible so much as we allow the Bible to read us. And that is reading with humility. Now, I know that some of you might be sitting and going, you know what, it's fine for you to talk about the Bible and the Word of God and that's great, but you know what? I have major problems with serious parts of the Bible. I disagree with serious parts of the Bible. Maybe some of you just go, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't even believe this stuff. And I want to say to you, that's okay. That's okay. But what I want to point you to, or the person I want to point you to, is the person for which the Bible is all about. You see, the Bible is written to us and tells the story of God's redemption story for us through the person and the work of Jesus. So even if you don't understand everything, start with Jesus, who says in Matthew chapter seven, after delivering one of the greatest oral speeches ever recorded, the Sermon on the Mount says, I have come to fulfill the law. I am the fulfillment of the law. John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Who is John talking about? The word of God. He is talking about Jesus. So start, if nothing else, start with Jesus and go from there. Soren Kierkegaard, that Danish theologian, also encourages us to read the Bible as if it was a letter to us, not some scientific document, not that the Bible does not contain scientific truth, but its intention is written to us. It's a love letter to us. Read it in that way. Humble yourself before the Bible. Now, this is difficult because I, I recognize in this culture, information is all tailored to be around us. So to go back to Google again, Eric Schmidt, the Google CEO said this, Google is something that understands exactly what you mean and gives back exactly what you want. The internet in the digital age is all tailored to serve us. And so our brains, the way that we are being shaped and think is that everything is shaped around us. I'm sorry, but the Bible is not like that. The Bible confronts us. The Bible reads us. And so I encourage you, when you come to read the Bible, come with a posture of humility and surrender 
and ask the question, God, what are you saying to me? Because that's like what James is saying, allowing the mirror, the word of God, to reveal something about us. Allow the Bible to read our hearts and our thoughts. Read with humility. Secondly, read with perseverance. Why? Because scripture is deep. It is not shallow. It takes time. Romans chapter five says, perseverance produces character and character hope and hope will not disappoint us. The Bible will not disappoint you. It is deep, not shallow. It is not surfing. Surfing is not deep. It skims across. The Bible, invite, James tells us to read the Bible. We are to persevere, go deep. Now, this is really hard for us. And I want to really touch on this because culture does not allow us to do that. The internet is chipping away at our capacity for concentration and contemplation. contemplation. I talk to people all the time who just enjoy jumping online and just skimming. You skim information, then you hit another hyperlink, you skim that information, and then you hyperlink. You just keep surfing, and that's why they call it surfing, internet surfing. You know what? Google is designed exactly that way. Google is designed to break your attention. Why? Because that's their financial model. Their financial model is, the way they make money is for you to stay there as long as you want and click as long as you want. Why? Because that generates advertising income. The more that you go to different pages, the more income they get because they get more money through advertisement. That is how they tailor things. People, we need to be aware of this. That the way that we function, the way that we consume information this way is designed for us not to go deep, but to skip and go shallow. That is the way it is. So Google are in the business fundamentally of distraction. That's their business, distraction. And that affects the way we think. New York Times article, June 8, 2013. The article said this, psychologists who study empathy and compassion are finding that unlike our um, almost instantaneous responses to physical pain, it takes time for the brain to comprehend the psychological and moral dimensions of a situation. The more distracted we become and the more emphasis we place on speed at the expense of depth, the less likely and able we are to care. Now that's just in the area of caring. But I think this impacts on a whole range of, of, of circumstances. Why? Because I think that our brains are changing. I'm talking to someone yesterday and they're saying, you know what, I find it, I find it really hard just to sit through a 20-minute sermon. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm almost hit my 20-minute limit now. It's hard, isn't it? We get distracted. That's why I asked you to turn your phones off. Why? Because I wonder whether even since I've been talking, you've been wondering who's texting, you know, what the score is on that sport game. Checking your Facebook. It's difficult, isn't it? I'm the same as I was at the Mumford, uh, Mumford and Sons concert last night. And the whole way through the concert, I was checking texts and just doing inform, you know, information searches on the bands. That's just the way I am. Maybe, and, and to be honest, this sermon is for me. This sermon is for me. I found this hugely challenging. I, you know, I didn't know this was an issue really until I started reading on this. And I hope this, this is enlightening for you as well. Daniel Goldman, the author of Focus, The Hidden Driver of Excellence, writes this, overloading attention shrinks mental control. Life immersed in digital distractions creates a near constant cognitive overload. And that overload wears out self-control. We are digitally distracted and we struggle with self-control. Is this you today? I know it's me. It's biblical wisdom that will provide us with direction. It's biblical wisdom that will provide us with a way in which we can see, we can see what is going on. So what's the application here? Make time, make time, create time where you can just step away from digital distractions, where you can sit down and do something called journaling. It's called writing with a pen. Reading more than one page. People really struggle even to just read one page of dense material. I mean, the Bible is, is deep. Commit yourself to it. Concentrate. Create space and time. Turn off the digital devices. Get away from it. 
from the first moment, I don't, this is something, a discipline that I'm, I'm seeking to create more and more. The first thing I do is just sit in scripture. Don't check what's going on on BBC News or Facebook. You are creating an environment for distraction from the very moment you wake up. Ignore the phone in social settings. I was talking to someone the other day that there are parties now where you actually have to hand in your phone when you walk in and people really struggle with it. You know, people get the shakes, you know, when they, when they have to hand over their phone. I mean, even you today, there was reticence probably of somebody, why is he telling me to turn off that phone, my phone? How dare he tell me to turn off my digital device? That's my life. I was talking to some parents the other day and went on holidays. They, they know it takes about three days for their kids to detox from being with digital devices, television. Parents, can you see that? And so there's a practical, I think, application here for parents as well. Limit your screen time. Don't have devices on during meals. Turn it off. Turn off the computer, turn off the television. Create space and time to communicate with one another. And spend time reading this. Do it with your kids. I know it can be difficult, but persevere. Allow space for con uh, concentration. Allow space for conversation. It will be difficult. Your children will probably want to jump down. Can I go and watch the TV? Can I go and play my game? Whatever. Perseverance. Perseverance. And thirdly, James is saying obedience. Obedience. True wisdom, true hearing is applying what you hear. Jesus says this in Matthew 7 as well, right at the end of this Sermon on the Mount. He says, There's, there was this story of a wise and foolish builder. The wise builder is the one who built his house on the rock and that wise builder is like you. Hears the word and goes and obeys it. That's wisdom. Who hears the word, hears my word and obeys it, puts it into practice. I think our culture again has, in an information age, has been designed that we can delay obedience. Classic example, emails. Ah, the inbox. I'm just going to shuffle that one across. I'll deal with that later. We all know what that's like. When we read the Bible, we walk away and we obey it instantly. One of the things that we're encouraging people to do in small groups is dis discovery Bible studies. And this is the question that we ask, what are you going to do about it? Read the Bible, what are you going to do about it? So today, when you hear this, what are you going to do about it? What, how are you going to be a wise person today in applying some of these things into your daily life? Are you going to be a wise person or a foolish person? So why do we read the Bible as we, um, as we come into land? Firstly, it's for freedom. It liberates us. James says that we are liberated when we encounter and believe and apply the word of God. Because the reality is, is that I think that whether we know it or not, many of us are addicted to surfing, the internet, clicking on and just surfing. Why? Because it's a drug. It is a drug. I do believe the internet does do something in our brain which creates neural pathways which, which is, is for enjoyment. And that is what we are finding out that is what researchers are finding out. It's funny how we create tools for our own benefit that, that they become our master, like some kind of scary, spooky Matrix movie to show my age, if you've ever seen The Matrix. A psychiatrist in Italy called Federico Tonno, I'm not even gonna try, a second, try his last name there, um, he opened his first public clinic in Rome, and this is what he observed as he wrote. He said, in my work I noticed basic changes in the way of thinking. In my interviews with drug addicted patients, it was, if, it was if something structural had changed on the level of their minds, and in particular, young addicts. So we started a pilot project, a clinic for internet dependence. Out of the, that experience, we identified five types of addiction, online pornography, online gambling, information overload, which is the ceaseless searching for useless information, social networks, and role-playing games. It's addictive. So I want to ask you, is Google your God? Is Google your God? 
You see, the Bible invites us into something very different. The truth of the gospel invites us into freedom. Into freedom, it liberates us. Why? Because we don't need this stuff. Our identity and our hope is not located in how much information we know and whether we are connected in or not. Our our identity is located purely in who Jesus is and what he has done for us and what he speaks over us. That is liberating. And that is what James is saying here. The truth of the word of God is liberating. Where is your hope? Where are your idols? Who is your God? Who is your God? And finally, when we read the word of God, when we persevere in it, we are rewarded. James says we're blessed. With wisdom comes blessing. With perseverance, working at it, understanding, mining it, allowing it to speak to us, allowing the word of God to address us and shape us and inform us. We are rewarded. We are blessed. It's a discipline, it's work, it takes humility, it requires obedience, but with it comes blessing. And so my invitation to us today is to allow scripture to saturate our minds and our hearts and our everything. Allow the word of God and the truth of Jesus Christ to be the thing that saturates us, that is our the thing that we turn to, not the internet, not to surfing, not to Google. Spend time with him, cultivate it. Sit in his presence, allow him to speak, sit humbly before scripture and meditate. Sit quietly, respond and allow your mind to change so that you can see what is going on in culture, so that you can as we've been doing today, critique culture, see what is going on, and then recognize that you can create in it. I'm, I don't want to say that this, everything is bad about this digital age. It will provide us with opportunities far more than we can ever realize. I was talking to someone last week who's from Iran, and he's saying, yep, the Bible is available in that nation. Now, why? Through, through apps, through the internet. There are amazing opportunities for mission and ministry, but we can do that when we're able to critique and see what's going on. Shall I pray? Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for Jesus who fulfilled the law and who speaks life and grace and freedom over us. And that is the life that we want to lead. God, we don't wanna be just people who just get get swept away with everything that happens in culture. Lord God, we we wanna be able to see and know how our minds and how our children's minds are being shaped and formed. And God, we want our minds to be shaped and formed, not by the way in which we live in this culture, but we wanna be formed and shaped by scripture. Lord, I pray that you'll give us a spirit of humility and a spirit of perseverance and a spirit of obedience, Lord Jesus, that you'll help us so that we can create, that we can speak into the culture and the context in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.